daily life. And of course, they had obligations. And one of the obligations of the military service. So here's my grandfather in the First World War, my father uh, as an officer in uh, Albania uh, in the Second World War, and myself in the Greek Navy many years later. <laughs> Then came the Second World War and everything changed. Italy declared the war to Greece in 28th of October of 1940. And the Jews fought together with the Greeks as they had done all along. There were close to 13,000 Jews that fought with the Greek army which was victorious in Albania, the first high-ranking officer that died in this campaign was a Jewish colonel, Mordechai Frizis. There were 513 killed during this uh, war, many wounded, out of which about 1,300 seriously, and tragically enough, they were the first one to go to the concentration camps and perish. Jews not only supported the war with, with, with human bodies, but also financially. I was fortunate to find a copy of this letter from 1940 because it mentions my grandfather on the other side. And uh, the Jews together with the Greeks, those were merchants, they met and they agreed to establish a fund to support the campaign so that we don't leave anybody starve. Unfortunately, the Italians lost the war, but their big brother, the Germans, came in their help. And so Greece was occupied in April of 1941. And if you can see the map of Greece, the, very, the darker areas are the areas of the Germans. Unfortunately, that's where Salonika is. And I, 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 it's, it's known that they took Salonika by design because we now know that they had sent people to document the treasures of the Jews, who had the paintings, who had the money, who had the stones, and they went right there. Anyway, you can see, however, that the bottom and most of the mainland was occupied by the Italians, and the Italians were not really hurting the Jews. As a matter of fact, in many occasions, they came in conflict with the Germans in an effort to, because the Germans were asking for the Italians to deliver the, German, the Jews, and they never did. And then there is a, a gray area right south of Bulgaria that was, the Bulgarians were part of the Axis, and they occupied the part of, of, of Greece. It's very interesting historically that Bulgarians in Bulgaria protected their Jews. However, they wanted an exit to the sea and they wanted to please the Germans. So they were brutal against the Jews and uh, as you will see in a minute, most of the Jews in this area perished. For the first few months, the Germans were not friendly, but they were really not bothering the Jews very much. And then. July 11th, 1942, a sunny, warm uh, Saturday morning, they called all the male population of Salonika in the Eleftheria Square, Freedom Square, for exercise. They didn't allow them to wear hats, glasses, they fainted and they were beating them up. After this day, they selected a large group and they took them in various areas for forced labor. The Jewish community had to pay a tremendous <coughs> ransom to the Germans to take these people back. And to this day, the German state has not returned this sum of money to the Jewish communities. And by September or October of 42, they were forced to wear a star, and slowly they were moved towards Manchik ghettos in poor areas of Salonika, and between March and May of 43, they were transported to Auschwitz and other concentration camps. The Jews from other 
All the other cities occupied by the Germans and also the Bul Bulgarians, as I said, were also transport transferred to Auschwitz, with the exception of a couple of convoys that it is said they, they were uh, the, the barges drowned uh, in the Danube. And it's said that the, the Bulgarians just didn't want to pay the gasoline for the further trip, so they just murdered them. So over 90% of the population of northern Greece perished. And then comes Athens. And you see these pictures, and those pictures are not from Auschwitz. Those are Greek kids starving to death from the brutal occupation. So the Greeks didn't really have too much of good intentions toward the Germans. In September of 43, after the fall of Mussolini and the capitulation of Italy, the Germans take over the rest of Athens, or the rest of Greece, including Athens. And um, Stroop, who was named as the butcher of Warsaw because he was the one who destroyed the ghetto in the ghetto in, in Warsaw in the spring of 42. He came to Athens and he issued a decree about all the Jews having to be present and on and on and on and on. Well, fortunately, things didn't go the way that the Germans wanted. And it didn't go because of many people that were determined to prevent from happening what happened in the north. The first was, as you heard earlier, Archbishop Damaskinos. He was a tyrant figure. He was sending memos to the German position Prime Minister Lothetopoulos since 1942 in an effort to save the Jews of Salonika and the north. And if you can see this famous letter which is signed by eminent professors of the university, the academy, and other areas in, in, in Greece, and they were all petitioning uh, in an effort to help the Jews of Greece. It is said that, that when he, he spoke uh, fluent German, and when he went to the uh, German uh, uh, commander, uh, when the Maschinos went to see the German commander, the commander said, stay out, because otherwise I'm going to shoot you. And uh, he answered uh, the, uh, the, the, the clergyman, the Greek clergyman, um, historically, are hang, and he meant what was happening during the Ottoman Empire. And so please, I want you to respect this tradition. And he left. And you can see in the bottom, this is from a book uh, written by, by, by a famous Greek author, Elias Venezis. Uh, this is the biography of Archbishop uh, Damaskinos. And if you're interested, you should read it because really, this is a fantastic figure. And he writes somewhere that I crossed myself and prayed to God. I decided to save as many Jewish souls. And so, even if I had to put myself in danger. And he called the chief of the police. There were places in Athens, there was a pharmacy, so that they don't all go to the, to the center of the police. And they were getting fake IDs. The second person was the chief of the police, under occupation, uh, Angelo Seppert. And uh, he's the one who furnished a significant number of fake IDs um, with Christian names. And uh, so that helped the Jews immensely. And then, of course, there were this great number of Greek families who, without any reason, without any monetary reason, or, or, or and with the danger of their life, they, were, they, they hit the Jews as many as they could right next to the German commandateur, there were people in hiding. And so, unfortunately, there was a small number of Jews that believed that the Germans were saying that you just put your names in the list and we're not going to hurt you. You come every Friday in the synagogue to report 
And uh, so one day in March 44, they called them because Passover was coming. And they called and they said, uh, uh, we're going to give matzah. Uh, and so the Jews went to the synagogue and then right away they closed the doors and they arrested them. And, about, <coughs> and then they arrested their families, so about 800 were caught during this event. Uh, there was a third person that was very important, and, and, and this is why uh, history is incredibly significant to appreciate little details. Why this happened in Athens and not somewhere else? It's not just an accident. It happened because several people stuck their neck out. And the third person was the rabbi of Athens. He was called by the Germans, and he was asked to provide the list of the Jews. He said, give me a couple of days, you know, it so happened that, that if a month ago this extremist uh, uh, Greek Nazi organization had uh, attempted to burn the synagogue. So he says, you know, there was a fire and they burned the archives, but I'm going to retrieve them, I'm going to give them to you. And instead of doing that, he, uh, he called a meeting with uh, the elders of the community and he said, get out wherever you can because this is what is happening. So that he is not get caught hostage as the rabbi in Kores in Salonika, the resistance took him to the mountains and his wife and, and daughter and because of all this, of these three people and because of all these other people that I mentioned earlier, a significant number of Jews in Greece survived. <laughs> then younger individuals uh, decide to go in the mountains and join the resistance, but that's not 1942 as it was in Salonika, that's already middle of 43 where the resistance is, is, is really had caught fire in the center of Athe or, or in the center of Greece, there were areas that the Germans wouldn't even go. Uh, and they fought in the resistance and several were killed uh, and you can see in this in this um, memorial, uh, in, it's a small memorial, um, and uh, there are three Jewish names there that died uh, during this particular battle. And then there were others that find their way with small boats to cross to Turkey and then end up in Egypt and join the British forces fighting the Germans in different fronts. These pictures are from Remember, in Athens was March 23, and March 25, the Germans rounded up the Jews from the rest of, uh, of Greece. This is from Yanina, um, and uh, unfortunately, in Yanina, most of the community perished. Uh, this slide is busy, but if you read quickly the numbers, you can see in the north, you see the loss of population close to 90, 95, 97 percent. And I want to draw to your attention in the number 23 where it says zero and we're going to talk about that in just a minute. We know what happened in Auschwitz and this is not the day to talk more about that. Uh, what we don't know or what most don't know is that the, the Jews that were hostage in Auschwitz, among other things, they had songs where they talking about sweet love Greece. They were longing Greece, they were looking and counting the moments if they are alive to go back and share the sorrows with beloved Greece. And this is Beri Nachmiya, a very good friend. Her granddaughter is in the audience tonight. And uh, she was the first one who came out in 19, around 1980, she was one of the first who said her story because immediately after the war, there was silence for a long time. And she became a wonderful spokesperson in all the events. And so, there was also resistance in Auschwitz. People say, oh, the Jews, they didn't do anything. They were just were going there and they were going to the concentration camps in the trains. There was resistance in, 19, in 1944. Uh, this man, uh, who was a lieutenant of the Greek army, together with a group of, uh, there were about five more Greeks and some Poles and a couple of Russians. This 
this is the crematorium number four. They bombed it. They had women working in, um, in a factory of ammunition, and they got ammunition, and they started a revolt, they killed the guards, and they destroyed number four crematorium. They put on fire number two crematorium, number three crematorium. So the Germans were left with two, and that was important to them because that's the only way that they could speed up killing. Then in parenthesis, there were some Jews in Greece with Spanish passports. The ones in Salonika, they were taken to Bergen-Belsen. Now, Bergen-Belsen was a concentration camp, but not an extermination camp. People died from typhoid and other reasons, but they were not killing them there. So they stayed for about seven months, and then Franco allowed them to go to Spain. The Jews from Athens, that was different. They were deported in 1944, and they had to stay in the concentration camps until the liberation 60 years ago. And you can see the coat of one of these ladies that came back to Greece. <coughs> and, you know, she comes back and she has nobody. She has nothing. So I'm looking for to go somewhere else in a place where I have no memories. Athens and most of the mainland of Greece was liberated in October of 44. I want to share with you this because I think it's, it's incredibly interesting. This man, Marcel Nazari, was in Auschwitz. He found out, he was keeping a memoir, and he, and somehow, he would find a piece of paper and bury it, and he wrote this, I'm dying happy since I know that at this moment our beloved Greece is free. Well, he survived. And in 1980, workers in Auschwitz found what you see down there was a blanket with his memoirs. So now they are in the museum in Auschwitz, but we know very well that what is said in there was written and is now in the museum. <coughs> so not only he survived, but his memoirs survived. There was destruction after the war. Greece was actually destroyed after the war because in addition to the war, then there was another several years of civil war. You can see the destruction of the, of the, uh, in, uh, in